Good afternoon. My name is Regina Calcaterra, and I recently wrote a book, which is a memoir, about uh, my siblings and I and how we grew up on Long Island, which is, for most of you may know, that Long Island is a part of New York. And it's a suburb that actually exists between Manhattan and the Hamptons. And people's perception of how people live in New York, especially between Manhattan and the Hamptons, is that it's, it's a well-to-do community. But the reality, like any other urban area, is once you get outside those urban area and go to some of the suburbs, there are pockets of poverty in those suburbs. And my siblings and I actually grew up in, that, in those pockets of poverty. So what this story is about, it's about these five kids, which I was one of, who was born to the same mother, and, five, and we had five different dads. And our fathers didn't stick around at all after we were born. And our mother was mentally ill. But at that time, she wasn't really properly diagnosed. So she self-medicated uh, self dealing with her mental illness through drugs and alcohol. So ultimately, she was not really able to raise five children. So what she did is she was always creative enough to kind of find a place for us to stay, whether it was an apartment or a house, for a little while before we were evicted, or out of a car or behind a supermarket. Sometimes it was in the streets, in a homeless shelter. Occasionally, we ended up in foster homes. But when we weren't in foster homes and we were under her care, she would leave us someplace. And she would leave us there for weeks or months at a time and just go. So we were these five kids who had to figure out how it was we were going to survive. And our goal was to stay under the radar screen and not let anyone know how we were living. Because by that point, but after a few years, we realized that we were better off staying together as opposed to being five kids separated in different foster homes. Because the things that happened to us in foster homes were much more challenging to us than the things that happened when we were under our mother's care. Because the reality is that we rather deal with the devil that we knew than the devil we didn't know. So we made a pact at an early age to not let anyone know how we were living. So we still managed to stay under the radar for years and years and years and just figured out ways to survive. And one of the things that we would do was steal food to eat. We would do that in supermarkets and did it in a very savvy way. But we would also literally go hunting for our food. We lived on Long Island, which at that time there was there farmland and, of course, there's a lot of beaches. So we'd either go to farms and try to pick vegetables and just you know, grab and dash, or we'd go to the beach and we'd actually look for mussels and clams. And if we were in a home where we could actually cook them, take them home and prepare them there. And that's how we survived. We also spent time going to school once in a while because my mother had a lot of warrants out for her arrest. So she would register us in school, but when the warrants were really um, accumulating, she would decide the best thing to do was not to register us in school because the authorities would figure her out. So we would be in school sometimes, but when we weren't in school, we would have to figure out what to do. And because we were abandoned and on our own, quite frankly, for five, for five kids who were kept alone without a parent, our job was to have fun all the time because as any group of five children would have when they're left without a parent. So we would do our best to entertain ourselves and try to insulate our younger siblings to what was going on as opposed to the experience that the older siblings were having in trying to create this safe environment. But we also were creative in try how it was we were going to educate ourselves. So we spent a lot of time going to the library. Because if you think about it, think about what libraries are, they're temperature controlled. And they're a place that kids who are poor can go and kind of hide away in a corner. And that's what we did. We went there when it was cold in the winter, it was always warm in the library. And when it was hot in the summer, it was always cool in the library. And we would sit there for hours and sometimes a full day until it closed. And we'd be reading. And I read, and I also taught my younger siblings how to read. And it was that time that we actually spent in the library that gave us, and also time in school, that gave at least me the ability to imagine what life could be like outside of my existence. And once I started imagining what that life could be like, then my goal was to ultimately work towards it. And I did it by reading every possible book I could on Amelia Earhart, because to me, this woman was incredibly gutsy during her time and did not let anybody define her. Well, I also read every possible landmark series book that I could have. And for some of them, some of you who don't know, there were these books that were printed in the 1950s by Random House that were called the Landmark Series. And they were written about historical figures. And three of them were actually written on women. The rest were written on men. So I think I read the Pocahontas book like a million times over that I possibly could. 
but, oh, but this is how we lived our life. I mean, we lived on the fringe of society. We did our best to avoid um, being noticed by anyone and, um, and to tr try to avoid staying in foster homes. And that lasted until I was about 14. Because what ultimately happened is my two older sisters moved out of our environment. I'd like to say moved out of our home, but we really didn't have a home. And I was left at the age of 11, actually, taking care of my two younger siblings. And that lasted until I was 14. And then something happened that I wasn't able to get past, where I finally broke down. And I was the one who told social services how it was that we were living. And in that effort, I also moved to emancipate myself, which back in 1980, when you're at the age of 14, you were able to become emancipated. If you could prove to the court that you're a better determinant of your, what your future is than your parent is. And I was easily able to do that by writing an affidavit telling the court at that time how it was that we lived our life. And that's what Etched in Sand kind of walks you through. At the beginning of the book, um, I start out when I'm 14 years old, and in a few critical months leaving, or 13, few critical months leading up to when I was 14, when I was about to tell the world how it is that we were living, and then I start writing the affidavit, which takes the readers through the backstory of how it is that we managed to survive. Unfortunately, what happened is when I went to emancipate myself, I also moved to try to get my mother's rights over my younger siblings relinquished, and they were in a different foster home. So when she found out I was doing this, she went to that foster home for a Christmas visit, took them out of that home, which was in Suffolk County in New York, and kidnapped them and brought them to Idaho. So for the next decade, um, I had to work to try to convince the authorities in Idaho that she was a bad mother and try to have them start paying attention to how it was that we lived. But they wouldn't pay attention because I was a poor kid, I was in foster home, I was homeless, and I was essentially parentless and I was marginalized. And when kids grow up in a situation like that, people perceive them as not having credibility. So they didn't give me any credibility or my, or my older sisters as we fought to, to protect our youngest siblings in Idaho. Now I'm fast forwarding, which was also um, uh, mentioned in the book. Ultimately, I finished high school. I put myself through college. Later on, I went to law school at nighttime. I was a partner in a law firm for a long time, and now I work for the governor of the state of New York. How did that happen? And it happened for two reasons, and two reasons why I really wrote the book. One is that in the United States, there are, are every year there are over 400,000 kids that are in forced to care. 10% of them age out to no one but themselves at the ages of 18 or 21. So what happens, they turn 18 or 21, depends on what state they live in, and they're given a one-way bus pass and the address of the closest homeless shelter, and that they wish good luck. And they have to live on their own. Now they're out of care, and that's it. And many of you who have teenagers and, and, and kids who are young adults know what it's like. The last thing you're about to do is kick your child out at the age of 18 or 21. Some of them are still living with you to 26 these days. So, but that's ultimately what happens. So you've got at least 46,000 kids a year who were pushed out of the system nationwide have to live on their own. But there are so many other kids who aren't in forced to care, who are impoverished, who are homeless, who are abused, and they're questioning why it is that they were dealt the hand that they were dealt. They look around and see the families of, of others that are much better off than theirs and are questioning why it is that they were born into this situation and how come they weren't fortunate enough to have the resources that others have. And they're gonna hope one day that someone's gonna come and rescue them, as I did. I always hoped for a parent. But the reality is that unless people are gonna go in and start adopting older foster children, which is something you know I strongly advocate for, a lot of these kids are gonna age out to nobody but themselves. And they need to be shown that they could actually pull themselves up and out. Because the reality is that I was dealt a bad hand, my siblings were dealt a bad hand, but there are many other kids in the US who are also dealt a bad hand but we were dealt that bad hand here in the United States. And there are enough resources here in the US that if a child wants to pull themselves up and out of poverty, they could do it. But they have to do it with their own self-determination and they have to believe in their light. So what I did in Etched in Sand is gave them a realistic perspective of what it was like. Because for, and, and you're dealing with that in the audience, in, in, with the population that you have, especially if you have freshmen that are, that are um, in your college that are the first kids in their family ever to go to college. So they have no one 
to give them guidance. They don't know how it is that they're going to get through. They're probably struggling working several jobs at once and um, can't see themselves where they're going to be in a few years from now. So in writing this book, I did my best to give these kids a realist, realistic perspective to prove to them they could pull themselves up and out and that they will determine what their own future is. And they do not have to let their childhood experiences dictate what their fate's going to be. But also for them, it's going to be longer. They don't have a safety net. They don't have parents. They don't have that foundation. So it's going to take a, be a little bit of a longer path. It'll be a harder path. It'll be dark and isolating sometimes. But they're the ones who are going to pull themselves up and out by, by believing in their light. And that's what this book shows you, is how, that there are enough resources here, and how, you've just got to figure out how to harness those resources. The second reason why I wrote the book is because we were kids growing up in this situation. And when we had foster parents, most of our relationships with our foster parents was transactional. They got a check, we got a bed. They got another check, we got some food. So it wasn't always these warm, loving environments when we were in foster care. And any other relationships that we, we had with adults were, were, at least the adults that were around our life, most of the time was very challenging. But really what pushed us through was the other adults. See, we were transient kids, moving in and out of schools, moving in and out of homeless shelters and various different situations, and I was a dirty kid. I was dirty, I was messy, I didn't know how to blow my nose. My siblings and I had one toothbrush that we ex shared with each other, which was really flat bristles. And um, cause quite frankly, if you're gonna steal something, you're not gonna think about stealing a toothbrush as a kid, right? You wanna steal something better. And um, so we weren't well kept. So if I would befriend a child, there would once in a while be a parent that would let me stay over their house. And I would learn what a healthy environment was. They would teach me how to blow my nose. They would give me a toothbrush, maybe some extra clothes. And um, as opposed to a parent, which there always once in a while, that, that would tell people stay away from that kid. And I also had teachers. Again, transient child moving from place to place to place. But I had enough teachers in my young life that actually told me I was smart, I need to read, I need to stay in school, and the only way to pull myself up and out of poverty was to continue my education. And these were the types of touches I had in my life. So what I do in Etch and Sand, which is written as a first person narrative, so it reads as a novel and it does it pretty quickly, is I show the reader who it is that touched us in a bad way and who touched us in a good way. And those people who touched us in a bad way, I changed their names because it wasn't about calling them out, but it was about to identify how people can actually impact the lives of these kids by the way that they respond. But those who touched me in a good way, they're all in the book because they deserve to be recognized. And they also, it makes you aware and it makes the reader aware and will make your students aware of the role that they could actually have in somebody's life. Because for that moment in time, when you have that child before you and you give them positive reinforcement, that's one touch. And then if as these kids continue moving on and other people are touching them the same way, it's accumulated. And that's exactly what happened to me. I didn't have one constant denominator as a parent. I had good touches and I had bad touches. And when it was time for me to make a decision about the path that I wanted to go down, was it going to be the dark path? Was it going to be a statistic? Or was it going to be the better path of having a healthy environment and getting an education? I chose this path because I had more positive touches in my life than I had the negative touches. And even though I knew statistically what happens to a kid like me, and this is what you're facing with, 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 uh, 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 with a significant portion of your population, with your income freshmen who are first generation as well, is statistically, if they come from poverty, homelessness, forced to care, any situation like that, this is what's supposed to happen to them. As soon as they turn 18 or 21 and they age out or they're on their own, 50% of them are going to end up homeless sometime in their life. Another substantial percentage is going to end up incarcerated and or um, we should have been drug and alcohol addicted, we should have been homeless ourselves, we should have been impoverished, and we should have continued the cycle of welfare dependency. But none of us did that. All five of us within one generation actually cut the cycle. And that's what we show in this book, how it actually happened. And it happened because of the good touches. Because for that moment in time, we had the right people before us. But it also, a lot of it had to do with our own self-determination as well. 
So what the story is, I mean, every day, I'm so fortunate because every single day I'm getting emails and, and letters from people who have read the book around the world, either through my Facebook author page or, or through my website. And, um, but the most provocative um, indication of the impact of my book actually occurred when I was in Sudbury, Massachusetts. I was speaking to a series of book cl clubs. Three book clubs got together in a home. Everyone there read the book except for the husband of the homeowner and the 16-year-old boy, which was in the room. That was his, their son. And I, was, and I was supposed to be there two hours and ended up being there three and a half, which I promise won't happen today. Um, because a lot of people read the book and they had a lot of questions. Um, but for those who didn't read the book, I was giving them examples of how it is that people touched us negatively and positively and how we could have went either way. At the end, at the end of the three and a half hours, I'm sitting there, signed my last book. The husband comes over. I thought he would want me to sign a book. I look up at his face. His whole face is damp. He's been crying. And he said his wife didn't want him to come over and talk to me because he was so upset. He, she wanted to wait for him to kind of get himself together, but he said he couldn't. The reason why is because Sudbury, Massachusetts is a wealthy community. And there's one house in Sudbury that the parents there are drug and alcohol addicted, and they have a 16-year-old son. And they told, and this family, this man who was sitting in front of me, told his 16-year-old son to stay away from that boy. And everyone else in that community told their child to stay away from that boy. And that boy's been there for years. And he said he realized what he's done, that he had the opportunity to change the tra trajectory of how this child was going to go by just being kind, by opening up his heart and opening up his home. And so is their entire community, and they have forced him down that other path. And he said that he didn't realize the impact of what they were actually doing. He thought he was protecting his child, not hurting the other child. And he said what he was going to do the next day is go and speak to that boy, invite him over, and start talking to everyone in the community and tell them it's their responsibility to do what they can to protect him and take care of him for that moment in time. They don't know how he's going to turn out, but for that moment in time when they have him before him, that's what they have to do. And that's what this book has done. Another message I received from um, a woman who is one of the top people that runs the Children and Family Ministries in Australia. She wrote and said, every single day I go to work and I wonder whether or not I'm actually having an impact on these kids' lives. And she said, after I read your book, I realized it doesn't matter if I actually know. It's not my job to know. It's just my job to get up every day and continue doing what I'm doing because it is going to make an impact. I'm not going to know how these kids turn out at, at the end of the day, but I need to continue making that difference. And another letter, I promise I won't list them all, but this is the last one, is I received from a principal down in West Virginia, which you have a lot of rural communities down in West Virginia, and she has been told over and over again by her other teachers that these kids that come before us, they, all these poor transient kids, that they're a lost cause. And she said after reading the, this book, she realized they're not a lost cause. And she's going to go and give this book to all the teachers that she can to show them that they have this responsibility to do what they need to do for that moment in time. They don't have to take the child in. They don't have to adopt them. But they're there before them. And that's what this book actually has done. It's not only inspired those kids who actually need to be shown that they have the ability to pull themselves up and out. It also shows all the readers the role that they have and the impact that they have for that moment in time for helping out a child who's actually in need and just giving them the positive reinforcement that it does, um, that they need. And it's also a story of great resilience. I mean, so much so that CBS Sunday Morning with Charles Osgood did a piece on um, the science of survival. They had two case studies in it, a woman that was bit by a shark and me. So she led because she bled. That's how it went. But, uh, but I was in the piece, too. And more recently, Jamie Redford, the son of Robert Redford, who is a documentarian, which makes sense, Robert Redford, Sundance Film Festival documentaries. Of course, his oldest son is a documentarian, is doing one on resilience. And kids who go through childhood trauma and how they pull through. And so he has interviewed me for the film just to show that to, just to give people an indication of how it is that I actually pulled through. And a lot of it has to do with optimism, because this is a book of inspiration, and it's a book of optimism and just controlling your fate. And um, so if you're interested in the book, it, the way you can contact me is I have a website, and I have a Facebook author page. I, I could answer any questions that you potentially have. But it's a book that will inspire. It will encourage these, the, um, the children that you're working with. And it's also going to remind you and others around you 
the impact and the role that you actually have because what you really do matters. Thank you.